four. We paused in the lobby to allow the president to don his disguise. You never know whom you might meet in the hallways of the inn, because it has forty-two rooms on three floors, not counting the dungeons or the turret, three libraries, and several conservatories and cozy parlors. It is possible to overlook a quiet chemist intent on his research, or a monk meditating in a corner. The president was pulling down his hat brim when Melvin and Prissy came in. The mayor must have made his way back to town because he wasn't with them. Prissy was carrying a pigeon, however. The creatures, coop and all, had arrived by coach along with Wally's cousins and their boxes and trunks just two months before. May I present Melvin and Priscilla? Ah, ah, chew! Wally sneezed. Please leave the pigeons outside, Pris. You know Mother doesn't allow them in the house. And I've told you, I am a chew. Wally rubbed his nose. I meant allergic, of course. And we've told you that Columbidae are nothing to sneeze at. Melvin insists on referring to pigeons by their scientific family name. He is a Kennewicket, after all. The question is, what kind of Kennewicket? Oliver has whole subsections in his journal dedicated to Melvin and Prissy. If he knew half of what they were up to, there would be reams more. But Wally believes that scientists in training should never be tattletales. I could feel a growl growing inside me. Melvin calls Wally runt or nincompoop when he thinks no one else can hear. Someone should tell Melvin that dachshunds have excellent ears and a very good understanding of slang. A runt is someone who is smaller than he should be. Nincompoop means a stupid or foolish person. Wally is small, but he is never foolish. And if someone were to talk to Wally's cousins, they might also mention to Prissy that dachshunds are not unskilled in the art of deduction. When I see her sneaking out of Wally's room and later find a feather folded into his pillow slip, it is simplicity itself to deduce exactly how it got there. Wally pretends his cousin's cutting comments and cruel jests don't concern him. He also tries to pretend that scientists in training don't cry. Wally isn't very good at pretending, at least not late at night when all the lights are off and his parents are fast asleep. My theory is that Melvin and Prissy have far too much of Mars Kennewicket in them. But President Roosevelt couldn't be expected to know that. He tried to be pleasant to the rotters. Pleased to meet you, he said. I understand that you are Walter's cousins. Precisely, Prissy said primly. Are your parents living at the inn? We're orphans, Melvin offered. Wally winced. I shook my ears. Melvin and Prissy are not orphans. Their parents have been traveling in Europe for sixteen years, leaving the family's concerns completely in Oliver and Calypso's hands. Wentworth enjoys the hospitality of prime ministers and kings. He apparently enjoys it more without his children, which was why they'd lived in a series of boarding schools before being sent to the inn. Oliver insists that even pretend orphans often turn out better than expected if they are given a chance. But he had also insisted that Jeeves, his first attempt at an automated lab assistant, would not go mad and use his retractable rail cannon to try to take over the world. The desire to rule the world appears to be the first symptom of a malfunctioning mind. If you must befriend hobos, Walter, Prissy whispered loudly, you should do so outside. I'm sure they are much nastier than pigeons. Quite right, Melvin said. Remove this dusty person immediately. Kennewickets do not consort with the riff and raff of this world, Walter. Ow! Melvin grabbed his ankle. 
He didn't have to hop and howl in such an undignified manner. I hadn't nipped him that hard. I'm positive my parents would not approve of removing him, Wally said. In fact, I have been instructed to give Mr. T.R. Mr. Roosevelt put his hand on Wally's shoulder. His spectacles flashed. Call me T.R., son. I have been instructed to give T.R. a tour, Wally said, pinking slightly at the deception. It is possible that Wally would not make a very good spy. Then tour somewhere far away from us, Priscilla said. right -o. The president winked at Walter. We will stay away. Shall we go, Walter? An automaton infestation, vicious dogs, and hobos, Melvin said as Wally walked away. What next? There are Kennewickets, and then there are Kennewickets, Prissy said, stroking her pigeon's head. Changes may need to be made. Chapter 5 Dust bunnies peeked at us from every crack and crevice as we went down the stone stairs to the dungeons, where the Kennewickets famous laboratory is located. Calypso feels that keeping experiments in the subterranean regions is safer for the guests. Mr. Tesla had almost leaped with joy when he'd visited the lab. The automated inn was the only facility on the planet that perfectly met his needs. The rooftop scraped the clouds, and the dungeons bored into the very core of the mountain. It is necessary for the machine to get a grip of the earth, the great inventor had explained, running his hand along the cold stone, a grip so deep that the whole of this globe can quiver. Mad Mars's delving into the mountain had apparently made this gripping the earth possible. When we reached the deepest level, Wally helped me into my lab coat and goggles. Science can be a perilous pursuit, he explained, as he handed the president a lab coat to replace his hobo disguise. Quite a lot of storage here, the president observed, patting the sides of his coat. Mother designed them, Wally said proudly. Father and I both find a plethora of pockets useful in the lab. When Wally had donned his own gear, he pulled a lever, and the giant doors swung wide. Magnificent, the president murmured as he stepped inside. Golden spheres hung in the air, spinning soundlessly. Arcs of blue electricity climbed ladder-like between giant posts. Copper flywheels moved cranks and shafts that led into the stone walls. We were surrounded by amazing mechanical apparatus. But if you looked closely, you could see that the lab was roughly divided, with one half reflecting Oliver's interests and the other half Calypso's. Nestled among the electrical contraptions on Oliver's side lurked the instruments of an ancient alchemist. Glittering curly cues of glass carried colored condensation from bubbling beakers. A small steam engine of ancient Greek design chuffed and rattled on the countertop. In contrast, Calypso's collection of advanced analytical engines, drafting tables, mannequins, and a well-sorted selection of millinery looked completely modern. I met Jeeves's eye in her full-length modeling mirror. The ex-butler's head peered in a most unnerving fashion from amid the pile of parts under Wally's workbench, which was situated comfortably between the workspaces of his parents. I couldn't help but wish someone had removed Jeeves's malfunctioning mechanism from the jumble of junk, but the president probably wouldn't see his unsettling stare, not unless he sat down on the floor. What's all this? the president asked, examining the bin full of broken bits of wood, scraps of colored silk, wire umbrella ribs, rubber wheels, and kite tails on top of Wally's workspace. 
failed flying machines, Wally admitted. I have been trying to piece together the puzzle of powered, controlled flight. Failed? I have tried a thousand times, Wally said sadly. I fear it is time to give up. I thought this was a very good idea. The world needed many things, but powered, controlled flight was not one of them. Unfortunately, Theodore Roosevelt did not agree. Give up? He boomed. Never say so, Walter. The boy who is going to make a great man must not make up his mind merely to overcome a thousand obstacles, but to win in spite of a thousand repulses and defeats. Do you mind if I write that down? Wally asked, taking his journal from his pocket. Not at all, the president replied. He was apparently accustomed to being inspiring. I kept a close eye on Wally as he wrote. If he was suddenly struck by inspiration, he might forget the mesmers, the tour, and even the president himself. I frequently had to save Wally from disaster when he was caught up in a scientific conundrum. Once, I'd caught his coattail seconds before he was about to step into an empty elevator shaft. Fortunately, no fantastical idea formed in Wally's mind as he focused on his note. The president leaned over a vat of trapped lightning. He tapped the side, causing miniature bolts to arc inside the glass, searching for a way out. Is your mother's lightning-fast popcorn popper actually powered by the lightning your father collects? Yes, sir. Wally tucked his notebook back into his pocket. If the vendors buy machines, they will also order lightning bolts with which to power them. Father has collected an ample supply. And how do you transfer the lightning to the popping machine? Wally pulled on his gauntlets, opened the vat, and grabbed a bolt. Good gad, the president said. I felt this must be an exclamation of admiration for Wally's hair. Errant electrons, Wally explained, carefully drawing the miniature bolt out of the vat. Errant means wandering in search of adventure. There are always a few errant electrons in the air, and they are generally attracted to Wally's head. When lightning plays across the atmospheric electron collectors on the roof and sizzles down the wires to the voltage vats, Prissy claims Wally resembles a mad scientist. It takes one miniature bolt to power the popper. Father's device splits lightning bolts into smaller units such as this. Wally transferred the bolt to a jar. We mustn't waste any. The electrons in the vats are for Mother's lightning-fast popcorn popper demonstration. Father has diverted the power lines in order to transmit the next lightning bolt he collects to Mr. Tesla's lab. The president polished his spectacles and then peered into the gloomy recesses of the lab where the cable branched at a giant switch. One tree trunk sized bundle of wires snaked toward the voltage vats. The other led to a huge copper coil and Oliver's transmission device. The whole inn doesn't run on electrons harvested from storms, then? The president asked. Lightning stored in these vats was once used for the inn, Wally said, setting the jar on a shelf. My parents found electrical storms too unpredictable to power the daily workings of multiple automatons. I was glad he did not mention that Jeeves's malfunction came about after a particularly powerful lightning storm had supercharged his wiring. But the wind always blows here, Wally went on, which allows our gyrating generator to produce the regular electron flow we need. The spinning contraption on top of the model in? Can I get a look at the real McCoy? I shivered. The real McCoy means the real thing or the genuine article. Mr. Roosevelt was suggesting an excursion to the roof. Certainly, Wally said. We'd best keep our lab coats on, sir. 
Mother insists on it around any experimental equipment.